What's up everybody? I'm Jason and welcome back to another vlog. So I've got a couple of things I want to talk about today uh, and I may have a few extra as I go and I think of them, but uh, I want to start off talking about again the uh, RF, Canon RF 600 and 800 F11s. So subsequent to my vlog last week where I was talking about how I was pretty excited about them, uh, I, and in that vlog, I speculated that I thought that they may turn out to be uh, moderately priced. I'd say, and I think the right word to use is affordable. Uh, and it comes down to this. I didn't think that they were L-class lenses. Uh, I came to that conclusion largely based on the fact that they had an F11 aperture. And even though the RF system is smaller and lighter, uh, I couldn't see Canon putting out an L lens that was F11. I could see maybe, you know, they've done F5.6s, like the 400 F5.6L, and of course the 100 to 400 and now 100 to 500 zooms are F5.6s. Uh, but I just couldn't see them doing, and of course the 800 is an F5.6, the EF 800 F5.6L. Uh, but I just couldn't see Canon doing an F11. Um, I might see them push it a little more now with RF or with mirrorless than they have in the past, um, 7.1 and the 100 to 500, for example, but not to F11. And so subsequent to that vlog last week, Canon Rumors posted a picture of uh, purportedly of the Canon EOS R system as it will probably exist or as it's expected to exist at the end of uh, this year, or at least after the announcements in July. And in that picture, there are the two lenses and they're sized about what I expected. The 600 F11 DO is about the size of the 100 to 500. And I expect the 100 to 500 will be on the same approximate size, you know, in terms of order to magnitude or orders of magnitude, I expect it to be about the same size as the 100 to 400. Uh, you know, it might be an inch longer or something like that, but not like, it's not going to be a 600 F4 or, you know, something crazy like that. Uh, so the 600 uh, F11 DO is about the size of the, um, the uh, 100 to 500 RF. And the 800 was about three, maybe four inches is about a filter diameter uh, larger. So if they're using 77 or 82 millimeter filters, that's three and a half ish inches, inches or something like that, uh, roughly speaking. Um, but the real telling thing, again, my argument was that F11 uh, makes them, I don't think they're going to be L lenses or L class. So Canon doesn't cross brand DO and L. Uh, if it's a DO lens, it's not an L lens. Uh, at least branding wise. Now, in the case of the 400 F4 DO, that's very definitely an L lens in build, in, you know, basically all of the, the uh, relevant aspects of what it is to be a lens, it just, they don't, they don't cross the brand, so it's not a 400 F4 L DO, it's just 400 a DO. Uh, conversely, they have a 70 to 300 DO that's not quite, not, well, I would say it's very much not an L lens. It's sort of a prosumer, semi-pro level lens. It's not weather sealed like L lenses tend to be, uh, you know, that kind of thing. Now that weather sealing could be a product of age. It is a fairly old lens at this time, but, uh, you know, even when it was new, it really wasn't, in the same tier as the L lenses. It wasn't a, it wasn't a 100 to 400 and it wasn't a 70 to 200 F2.8 or F4. It was a like kind of a tier down, not all the way down to like the consumer level 70 to 300s, but not an L level 100 to 400. And uh, so I, it, it's, you can't just look at the branding and say, well, it says DO, so it must be L. Um, that's not really indicative, at least with Canon, uh, or at least historically. Um, so they 
in this picture, as I said, they had the two lenses, the 600 and the 800, or what I assume are those two lenses, and they're gray. They're not white. And this is another one of those things that goes back to Canon branding, uh, white L lenses, big super telephoto lenses. Now, initially the big super telephoto lenses were made white because diffract or, um, fluorine, uh, fluorine, fluorite elements are more sensitive to light. It's a big lens. And so if you have a or, or heat, it's a big lens. And so if you have a big black lens, uh, it, is more likely to suffer issues or have issues with expansion and so forth due to the uh, fluorite, uh, you know, messing up the optics. So they were white. It was originally done, at least by my understanding, it was originally done to reduce the thermal load of the lens or to keep the lens from thermally cycling as much. Uh, it then became a branding issue or a branding thing as they started to use it in lenses that didn't have fluorite, that didn't need to have the same kind of thermal protection. And white lenses have basically become Canon's branding for big super telephoto lenses or super telephoto lenses of their highest tier. So all the big super telephotos are, uh, Basically, if it's an L lens and it's a long uh, telephoto lens, you know, if it tops out anywhere above 200 millimeters or 200 millimeters roughly and above, uh, you know, that 200 millimeter mark, there's obviously the 200 F2.8 that is black and there's the 200 F2 that's white. Uh, but, you know, if it's a big enough lens, it'll be white if it's sort of L quality. Uh, these lenses being gray indi indicates to me that they're not intended to be professional lenses. They're not intended to carry that highest tier of uh, branding. And consequently, uh, I think, again, my supposition is, is that they will not be as expensive as if they were, you know, L-branded lenses. So, you know, again, I'm still looking at or thinking they're probably going to be in the between thousand and two thousand or thousand thousand and two thousand dollar range. I wouldn't be surprised if they're higher, but uh, I don't think they're going to be four grand. I don't think they're going to be uh, eight grand or ten grand or anything like that. Um, but anyway, so what I really wanted to talk about in respect to the eight hundred f eleven is how I talked myself out of it. Uh, because in the last video, I was sort of on the fence about getting an 800 f11. The idea of having an 800 millimeter lens that's you know autofocused and all of that kind of thing is sort of attractive to me. Uh, I I I used to do bird photography. I haven't done bird photography in a while, but I still have an interest in that, and I still have an interest, a, a serious interest in wildlife, bears, wolves, bison, that kind of thing. Um, and that's a big lens thing. So like when I went to Yellowstone two years ago, I rented a 600 F4 because, well, they're really expensive and it was a lot cheaper to rent one than it was to buy one. And, uh, you know, that was sort of my staple lens for wildlife in Yellowstone. And so the idea of having an 800 uh, that was affordable and practical and, you know, obviously being F11, there's some shutter or there's some light issues but it's very portable and the f11 and diffractive makes it very portable uh that was real attractive to me until i started sat down and started to to sort of think through the whole thing so i'm extremely interested in the 100 to 500 in fact for me that's almost a give, gimme i'm gonna probably end up pre-ordering that when i order the camera um, or pre-order the camera uh, I may not, but I, I know that lens is in my future. I have to sort of figure out what my overall strategy is going to be because while I know I'm going RF uh, with the R5, uh, I don't know if I'm going to end up selling both of my 5D Mark IVs and switching entirely to RF or if I'm going to stick with some DSLRs because I have them and they do what I need and I don't need to drop a shitload of money on two R5s right now when I also would need to replace or ultimately be looking at replacing a lot of glass at the same time too. 
Uh, but anyway, I know the 100 to 500 is in my future. That's sort of a definite. And when Canon announced that they were working on that or announced that, however you want to put it, uh, with it came that announcement came that they were doing a 1.4 and a 2x teleconverter. And this is kind of where I ran into the problem when I started thinking about this. So the 500, the 100 to 500 with a 1.4x teleconverter is a 700 f10. That's a third of a stop faster than the 800 f11. And it's a zoom. Now, I'd love to get away from teleconverters because they're kind of a pain in the rear to put on and put take off. And of course, you know, you have that loss of uh, aperture from the teleconverter. But then if the teleconverter is getting you like 90% or 85% or whatever the way to at 800 and you're still a third stop faster than the 800, it's not really a loss of uh aperture in the same sense that it would be, say, uh, put a 1.4 teleconverter on a 100 to 400 and you have a 560 f8, well, that's a stop slower than a 600, or two stops slower than a 600 f4, it's a uh, two stops slower than a 500 f4, you know, there's clearly a loss of aperture there compared to, in this case, it's a 700 f7.1, which is still faster than an 800 f11. So the question for me came down to, is that 100 millimeters really that important? And the answer that I came back to is no. Um, and so this is the problem. This is the struggle that I have with these lenses is if they're really cheap, if they're below a thousand dollars or a thousand dollars, you know, a thousand dollars or below, uh, then they, they may have some real practical value. Uh, conversely, if the 100 to 500 is like a $4,000 lens, which I don't think it will be, but you never know, uh, then this could, that could sway things as well. Uh, by making the 100 to 500 that expensive, uh, even though it's clearly not like a replacement for the 200 to 400 f4, it's a replacement for the 100 to 400 and the 100 to 400 is a 2000 ish dollar lens, uh, you know, add on a bit. And I, I think it should be about a 2400 maybe dollar, the 100 to 500 probably would be about a 24, $2,500 lens. Uh, you know, maybe a bit more, maybe a bit less. It's hard to say, uh, but if with an R5, you're, about 10% or well ignore the camera for a second with the teleconverter on the 100 to 500 you're about 10% short of the uh, 800 it's it's a little bit more or less i don't remember the numbers exactly but it's in that range uh, if you're shooting with an R5 you can crop in that 10% and it takes your resolution down to uh, like maybe 32, 35 megapixels, something like that. Uh, I did the math and I don't have my notes in front of me, which is kind of stupid of me for doing this. And it's another one of those, hey, look, I'm not prepared, but hey, look, I'm not prepared. Uh, anyway, a 32, 30, a, even a 30 megapixel image. So I use Canon 5D Mark IVs and thir they're 30 megapixels. And a 30 megapixel image, is way more information than you need in the vast, vast, vast majority of uh, prints that you might be making. Uh, I print um, and 30 megapixels will make a very large print at very good quality, assuming you're good enough to get that much, you know, to get the camera uh, basically Assuming you're good enough to meet the needs of the camera, you will get a f you know phenomenal image. This is way past the resolution of film, uh, and you could crop that and print to, like crazy. And so, 30 megapixels is great. 45 megapixels is in some ways like overkill. And the whole thing with 50 and 60 megapixel small format cameras 
is, is in a lot of respects just kind of bonkers. Uh, you know, I guess on one hand, like, I'm not going to reject it, but it's the diminishing returns of the that much resolution is, uh, well, they diminish exponentially and you do not get as much out of the camp. Like, you, there will not be as much gotten out of, say, going from you know, say uh, 30 megapixels to 60 megapixels as there was going from 10 megapixels to 20 megapixels. Uh, it just, the way, the way everything works out, it just, that's not the case. So you can crop in that 10% to get that 100 uh, or that 800 millimeter field of view with the f uh, 100 to 500 and a one four teleconverter. And it's not like you're throwing your image away you're not going to be, you know, it's not like you're going from, say, a 20 megapixel image to a 6 megapixel image or something crazy like that. It's, you know, uh, you're going from a, a 45 megapixel image to a 30, 30 to 35 megapixel image or something to that effect, uh, which is basically, you know, perfectly serviceable. And so, like I said, I started thinking about it and I came to the conclusion that it's kind of like so where's the where's the case to be had for the 600 and 800? They're primes. They're probably going to be about the same weight. They may be a little lighter than the 100 to 500. They may be better optically. That's one possibility because they are primes. Although because they're diffractive, you may it may not work out quite as well or as simple as they're better optically. Uh, I don't know. Uh, that's going to be one of those things that plays out in testing. But as it stands, a lot of my interest in that 800 kind of evaporated when I, you know, start, sat down and th thought about it and realized that the 100 to 500 gives you more flexibility. And, uh, you know, with the teleconverter, uh, uh, basically almost all of the 800 F11 without the, you know, with a third stop faster aperture. So, um, again, pricing and all of this may change the, the calculus on that. Uh, it could turn out that the 100 to 500 is really expensive and the 800 and the 600 are really cheap and that makes them very attractive uh, options. Uh, they certainly may be very attractive options, you know, even at around a $1,500 price point if you're not interested in dropping the 2500 for the 100 to 500 or that turns out to be like three grand or more um, but i'm not quite sure i see with that aperture with that f11 aperture i'm not quite sure i see where or or how amazing those lenses are going to be anymore uh, so you know what? I'm going to wrap this up here. I'm going to save the rest of my thoughts for next week. And um, I lied. I had intended to cut this vlog short, and then I realized that it's going to be publishing the week of Canon's announcements. And one of the things that I wanted to talk about is uh, Canon rumors the day before I recorded this. So it was... Uh, Tuesday or Wednesday of this week. Again, I'm sort of not doing this prepared. Uh, I had a post where they were talking about uh, Canon. Uh, the, it was a CR2 post, and it was saying basically that Canon has some features in store on the EOS R5 that for still photographers that they haven't talked about and that nobody's really, they, it hasn't gotten out, they've, you know, and that it's gonna be a surprise and hopefully uh, my words, not canon rumors, uh, hopefully will be useful functionality for still photographers. Now, again, I have no inside information on this. I just wanted to talk about some things that I would find useful as a still photographer and you know, in watching that or reading that post, which again had very little information, and uh, you know, CR2 is not the highest confidence from Can uh, from Canon rumors, uh, but 
it is in theory possible that Canon has some uh, still features that they haven't talked about because, you know, in this day and age with YouTube and everything, uh, I've said this to my photographer friends and they all get upset at me when I say this, but uh, still photography is a solved problem. Uh, it really is. There's not a lot that you can add to a camera with respect to still photography that is really new, really useful, really a big deal. Um, there's certainly iterative stuff that you can do to make the thing, you know, stuff better. Uh, there's certainly little features that you can add uh, that make things better. But, you know, in terms of like big game changing things, you know, there's no 8K in the still market anymore. Uh, there's no 120 frame per second slow motion video at 4K in the still market anymore. Uh, because we've already done that. We've already gone through 32 megapixels. We've already gone, you know, kind of through the roof. And really the best things that you can do, you know, that as a camera company that they could do is, you know, uh, frames per second, autofocus, uh, you know, tweak the autofocus or improve the autofocus, improve dynamic range maybe a little. Uh, but in, e and in any of those cases, you know, it's resolution, frame rate, dynamic range, color response. It's all going to be an incremental shift. It's not going to be, um, it, it just, there, there's already so much capabilities in our still cameras for stills that it gets really hard for there to be something really game changing uh, while still sort of preserving the the function and eth uh, function and capabilities or characteristics of a still camera as or you know of the cameras as it is I mean you know you'd have something like uh, Lytra's light field technology which you know, had a lot of promise, looked really interesting, but then the execution of it means that you'd have a uh, like 30 something megapixel sensor, but you only get a uh, you know eight or something megapixel, six or eight megapixel image out of it uh, because of the whole light field processing and capture stuff. And that's not something I really see uh, sort of wowing the world when it comes to uh, still cameras and cameras in general. Uh, but so I had some thoughts on this anyway, and I wanted to talk about them. Uh, the first thought I had is uh, dual ADC readouts. So Canon introduced this technology in the, C uh, the Cinema EOS C300 Mark III, and it gives the camera a better than 16 stop exposure latitude and basically what it does is there's an analog to digital sensor uh, running at one gain that is reading out the shadow uh, essentially the shadows of in the pixel and there's one analog to digital scent converter running at a lower gain that's reading out the highlights and so you get clean shadows and you know wider highlights uh, now of course this also requires the sensor be capable of uh, recording 16 plus stops. I don't think that's an issue. Uh, for years, the issue with Canon's cameras and sensors has seemed to been that the, it, not that the sensor can't record sufficient information or sufficient dynamic range, but because of the way Canon sensors are designed or have been designed with off-chip readouts and the way Canon's law or RAW files are organized, uh, the sensors uh, just couldn't, uh, you couldn't get the information out of the sensor even if the sensor supported it. You either had noise at the bottom or you clipped at the top. And to a certain extent we can actually see this in the capabilities that exist in dual pixel RAW where how Canon stores the data. Uh, they can get an entire 14-bit readout out of half of this pixel. So each of the two sub-pixels can be read out at, at, or, or are read out at, as 14-bit uh, conversions, uh, with a 14-bit conversion. And uh, 
Canon in the dual pixel RAW stores one copy of the image as the two sub pixels combined, so A plus B, and the other part of the information in the dual pixel RAW file is stored as B. And B, essentially if you add two 14-bit numbers together, the largest value that they can produce is a 15-bit number. And so unless you're storing a 15-bit number, then you, you're capable of clipping uh, the highlights, essentially, that top bit, when you sum those two things together. And so a um, company whose name slips my mind at the moment actually put out a piece of software, um, dual pixel raw something or other. I actually have it. I've used it like once. Uh, but that will essentially recover a stop of highlights from the dual pixel raw file as... Um, by using the data that's in the B subpixel or A subpixel information that's stored. Uh, so that's like one way you could do it. But like I said, Canon's dual, uh, dual ADC readouts, um, I don't think they call it dual ISO, uh, I want to say it's dual, dual something or other, whatever, uh, in the C300 Mark III has allowed them to get even more dynamic range out of the sensor and yeah, it adds some complexity in the computation and the, um, the electronics, but that's their problem, not ours. As a photographer, though, having a 16-bit dynamic range, uh, you know, camera capable of that would be, you know, nice to have. Uh, I'm not going to say I'm begging for it because, you know, the reality is um, I'm not. But, you know, it seems, you know, looking at tech Canon's techno uh, technical portfolio, it seems that that would be well within the realm of what they can do without requiring some craziness beyond, you know, something or other. And from the end user perspective, uh, you know, it should all be handled in the camera, in the raw, it, it, you know, the raw file comes out and it just has the data and it's just a 16-bit file or something instead of a, an 8-bit file or a 14-bit file. Boy, I've, yeah, not 8-bit, 14-bit. Um, so that would be one thing that I would really like, you know, or I, I would be, I'd like to see. I, I think it's feasible. I think it's within the realm of what Canon can do. Uh, I certainly think it would be something that if they can do it, it would put them in uh, in uh, in the running for top dynamic range on the market right now, or you know as well, which is a you know big selling point for a lot of the paper push or the the stat pushing um, non photographers that like to talk about how amazing cameras are uh, and kind of ignore the fact that you. Um, well, as I put it, uh, photography or photographs are the stock and trade of photographers, not pixels. And you can get a really good photograph with not so great pixels, and you can get a really bad photograph with great pixels. Um, they're not necessarily indicative of the performance one way or another. So that was one thing I want would, would like to see that I think Canon could do. I think they could do it where it wouldn't be something that they'd have to scream about or that would be like tremendously obvious or tremendously out there and you know um you know it would be feasible the second thing i'd like to see as far as i know right now nobody has raw histograms and raw clipping previews on canon cameras the clipping preview and the histogram are generated from the jpeg and uh, the JPEG preview. And so you end up doing things like setting the contrast all the way down to try and get the JPEG to cover the widest possible uh, range of brightnesses to give you the most accurate guess at what the raw, where the raw is gonna clip. Uh, and as far as I know right now, I think the only company that does raw Histograms is probably possibly phase or is phase is 
probably phase one and possibly Hasselblad Blad on their uh, medium format gear. That it's not a feature that Canon, Nikon, Sony, any of the small format people that I know of is has in their cameras. And it's always frustrated me because as a uh, still photographer and a raw shooter, uh, I should have the same tools or the, the full capability of tools that, you know, everybody else that shoots JPEG has is because, you know, why shouldn't I? Um, it just seems sort of like I'm shooting raw to get the maximum possible uh, dynamic range, et cetera, and latitude in my images and to evaluate them on the camera, I'm looking at a JPEG and the, the stats around that. Um, and that just, I don't know, has always annoyed me. I think it's always annoyed a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, still photographers who shoot raw. And the answer isn't to shoot JPEG or some other highly compressed format. The answer is the, the camera makers should give us a raw histogram and raw clipping date warnings and information about our raw files. Uh, and again, I don't see a huge technical reason why this wouldn't be possible. And of course, as we push to, uh, you know, as I keep saying, still photography is a solved problem. It's finding or presenting new things in still photography is really about uh, finding and cleaning up the edge cases. So the low hanging fruit have been uh, picked essentially. And now it's find the edge cases that can be used to make the job of the photographer, make the photographer's job uh, easier to, to, you know, make it easier for them to uh, compose their image, um, track their subjects, uh, have feedback about whether they're uh, clipping or overexposing, etc. cetera. Uh, so that's two. Three th third thing that I would like to see is synthetic neutral density. And I've talked about this either in a vlog in the past or I wrote a blog article about it. Uh, I know I wrote an article about how to um, synthesize neutral density using stacking in Photoshop. And you can also do it in the camera. I really should uh, sort of update that article to uh, kind of show all the ways it can currently be done. But currently it's kludgy. So for example, either if you're doing it after the fact in Photoshop or if you're doing it in the camera using the uh, multiple exposure averaging capabilities, the images are taken as a series of images taken sequentially. So if you have it, if you want to synthesize a two-stop neutral density filter, you need four images to average over because you need, uh, well, two to the two is four, uh, two to the second power is four, uh, so you have four times the length of the exposure because you're taking four images. And if you're doing it in Canon cameras now, for example, uh, using the averaging capability in the camera, you set your shot up, you compose it, and you set all the uh, averaging multiple exposure stuff, and then you hit the shutter release and you hold the shutter release down preferably with high, continuous high or uh, drive mode set. And the camera goes click, 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 click. And you get four exposures. I hope I did four clicks, but you get what I'm saying. Uh, and the problem with this is there's discontinuities. So this works fine in my experience if you're shooting uh, either something that doesn't move relative to the camera that fast. So like clouds won't move far enough uh, in the course of the shutter recycling that it generally that your cloud will have breaks in it in the you know final image. Uh, water the same thing it, it won't you you'll get a smooth blur uh, of the water not like choppy breaks. But 
artificial periodic things like say a fan uh, you know or a car moving or something like that where maybe the speed's high enough uh, it, it, again, it all comes down to how fast the thing covers the angles, moves through the angle of the view, angle of view. Uh, if the speed's high enough, you get gaps and it jumps. It's kind of like when you see uh, stacked images for star trails and there's little gaps between all the star trails and you think, wow, that's like, you know, it was because it was shot as a series of images that were stacked together. And you have that problem with potentially with synthetic neutral density. Th synthesizing it is an average of many exposures. Now, mathematically, if you will, it's the same thing. Uh, a neutral density filter attenuates light, so it's basically a optical divide by x, uh, you know, whatever the power is. So let's, again, say two stops. So it's an optical divide by four filter which requires you to increase the exposure time by a factor of four so that you effect effectively go from your, your, the, the neutral density filter is effectively dividing the light into the camera by four and the longer exposure is summing up the average of what would have been four exposures. And you can do, like I said, you can do this in software. You can take four short exposures and average them together in either the, you know, the camera, Photoshop, whatever, in software. And it does essentially exactly the same thing. Uh, it's not like one of these things where uh, you're creating some new thing. I mean, it's not like, say, stacking or HDR or uh, focus stacking or something where you're computationally coming up with something that you couldn't otherwise have done. Uh, it, it's, it's computationally or whatever, it's the same thing. It's just one's doing it optically and one's doing it mathematically in, the process, in a pro computer. Uh, the catch is, is that you, if you're going to do it in the camera, you really want a continuous uh, read. And this is like, you, you look at video, this is kind of uh, sort of the implementation. Uh, video will give you a, can, can give you a very nearly continuous read. And you don't care about things like rolling shutter. Um, you know, video people get annoyed by rolling shutter because it makes lines go wavy. And, uh, or like vertical lines in a pan will p pitch to one side. And that's annoying from a video perspective, but from say a synthetic neutral density perspective, it just doesn't matter because that's all going to get averaged out. And what's most important is not having gaps between frames. So the gap constantly rolling through the frame, uh, you know, as a rolling shutter, makes it just makes it work fine. Um, and so this is where the, like, uh, a camera could very easily, mo a modern camera that does live view and video and all this thing, uh, could very easily do synthetic neutral density as a feature. So you wouldn't need a neutral density filter. You'd get the exact same effect. In fact, in some respects, it would be better because, well, you wouldn't have to put the neutral density filter on. If you wanted to do very long, uh, or, you know, very long exposures with super high density neutral filters. Uh, so, like, um, if you've ever shot with the cheaper 10-stop neutral density filters, you find uh, the image is going to have a mass, a color cast. And the first one that I got was a format high tech one. And it was very, fairly inexpensive. I won't say very, but it was fairly inexpensive. And this was more than 10 years ago. Uh, they don't, they've changed their formulation. So this isn't even relevant to their new ones, but, uh, and it put such a strong green cast to my images that I couldn't even correct it out in post-processing. I had to just make the image black and white. So I replaced it with a Lee Big Stopper. And the Lee Big Stopper puts a blue cast to my images. Now, fortunately, it's not such a strong blue cast that uh, 
I can't correct it out in post, but it's still there. Um, and I've ultimately ended up buying just recently a um, breakthrough photography neutral density filter that is, was more expensive than either the Lee or the Format. I think it was about as expensive as both of them combined. And it does a very good job of being neutral. And it's really difficult for filter manufacturers to make a neutral, neutral density filter when you're talking about it's attenuating 10 stops, which is like 10,000, uh, you know, it's letting one ten thousandth of the light through the filter. If there's a tiny error in the balance, the red, green, blue color balance, or, you know, uh, it, that throws it off. If it lets ultraviolet or infrared through, that can throw it off. Like it's a very difficult and expensive process. If you're synthesizing neutral density, all that, none of that matters. The camera doesn't, it's a short exposure that the camera is recording and averaging. And it never, it's never, you'd ever have the problem of a filter attenuating, you know, I mean, basically like if the filter, if you have a neutral density filter and it attenuates the red light to one one thousandth and the green light to one one thousandth and one and the blue light to one nine hundred and ninetieth, uh, ninety ninth of the intensity of the light, those tiny little imperfections and imbalances become a color cast in the, old, in the resulting image. If the camera's just reading the sensor and adding data to a file in memory or whatever, you never pick up the color cast because you never have an attenuation happening at the, you know, in front of the sensor. It's just an average of the light being recorded at the sensor. And so it would be fairly, I think, fairly trivial for a camera, you know, like the R5 or whatever to add a synthetic neutral density mode where you basically, instead of like, as it is now with multiple exposures, you would um, change, you, you pick between one or two and nine frames uh, to, to average and you do this, you know, kind of whole routine. Um, so from a UI perspective, I should just be able to dial in how much synthetic neutral density I want, you know, 10 stops, 15 stops, you know, whatever. Uh, and then the camera, instead of having, you know, all these shutter actuations, basically would just flip the shutter up, start reading out the sensor. I mean, you know, it's a mirrorless, in the case of the EOS R, it's a mirrorless camera. The shutter's up mo open most of the time anyway. Start reading out the sensor and just averaging the, the image information into the output file. And, you know, like, I'm not going to get into the math behind how to do that because it's not really relevant to, you know, us as photographers. Um, there's ways to get it, you know, ways to do it. And there's, in fact, ways to do it where uh, you could say, basically, start record, uh, have the camera start averaging, and the preview that you're looking at would be, con could be constantly updated with the averaged image and when you had the amount of blur that you were you wanted or that you intended to have, you could just hit stop. And again, you, you know, exposures like you don't have to calculate a 30 second, 40 second, or, or 15 minute or 30 minute exposure. Uh, your exposure is just the exposure that you're metering as you go to take the image. It, you know, it's going to be pretty normal. Uh, so those are three things that I'm not. I have no idea, obviously, if Canon's going to have any of those things, but if there were three things that I, I could think of off the top of my head that would be really cool to have as a still photographer uh, that I haven't seen anywhere else, uh, those would kind of be three things that I think would be really fun and nice to have as a, you know, like I said, Canon gives us still photographers something new. Uh, so anyway, like I said, I was going to try and cut this short. Uh, <laughs> that didn't happen because of the times and when this is going to be released. So uh, I'm going to wrap this up here. 
Uh, I'd love to hear from you in the comments if you have any cool or crazy ideas for, you know, what you'd like to see as a still photographer in a camera. Uh, you know, obviously, uh, Canon isn't going to listen to me, but uh, I would be interested in hearing that. So, uh, you know, feel free to drop that in the comments. Uh, if you've made it this far, obviously, thank you for watching and until next time.